Welcome to our study tonight, Until That Day Ministries. My name's Randy Reese, and I want to say you're a blessing. Thank you for joining us. Do you know what the Bible teaches about Gog and Magog in regards to how it's connected with the battle of all battles, the battle of Armageddon? Where does the book of Zechariah and Ezekiel and the book of Revelation, as well as Daniel, how do they all fit together? I want to tell you, Bible prophecy is like a hand and a glove. It all comes together. What we're going to see and learn tonight is how these connecting the dots to each one of these books as to how this unfolds in God's prophetic future. I had the privilege of going to Israel. The Lord put it in my heart to, first of all, start this YouTube ministry back about 10 years ago. And in the proper timing, God has brought it to fruition. And I praise Him what He's doing. We covet your prayers, and we're praying for you as well. And two years later, to follow up on that vision and mission, the Lord led me to go to Israel and pursue a Ph.D. in Bible prophecy. Ph.D., post-hold diggers, not really. But you can see I'm holding a pad and pencil. I had to write a 100-page paper on all that transpired and all of the information we learned in that 10-day trip to Israel in addition to going to Turkey and Rome. It was behind me, you see, what's called the Valley of Jezreel, 1,000 square mile, where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Now, we're going to study more of that in detail in just a moment. But first, I want to give you a time frame in which we're talking about the Gog and Magog battle as well as leading up to racing to Armageddon. This would be included after the rapture of the church. I believe the snatching away the bride of Christ could happen in a moment. The imminent return, the twinkling of an eye, Paul put it, faster than a gnat can buzz its wing. Or GE has calculated 11 hundredths of a second that you can bat your eye. Yes, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ rise first. Those of us that are alive and remain caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one of these words. I love it when it's cloudy outside. I look and say, this could be the day. It doesn't even have to be cloudy. But after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist will confirm the covenant. And this will begin the time clock ticking in the seven years tribulation depicted in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel's writing to Jews, not the church. Keep in mind, Christ comes as the bridegroom for the bride in the rapture, but he comes in the second coming as the king. We'll come back with him, and he will indeed... Uh, fulfill his promise to Israel, which is the focal point of the seven years of tribulation. We'll be in heaven. So this is the time frame. You can see this is what we're looking at, the seven years of tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? I hope you've made peace with God. I hope you know that you know that you know. And, for example, and after the rapture or the snatching away of the bride of Christ, it comes this one war. It's really campaign of battles. Book of Revelation chapter 16 describes the campaign uh, of battles. This is uh, the battle of Armageddon. The word is poleme, which means a series. And this is what we're going to look at tonight, how they connect together, Gog, Magog, and the battle of Armageddon, as well as the passage in Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, the passage in Psalm 83, the passage in... Uh, Revelation chapter 16, and in Zechariah chapter 14. So get your Bibles out, call a friend, subscribe if you hadn't, and here's these two wars listed in this particular chart after the rapture of the church and before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in His second coming. No man knows the hour. By the way, no signs need to take place in order for the Lord to come back again in the rapture, plus Yet plenty of signs for the second coming. He described that in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. So here's what we're looking at, three phases. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one's going to look at Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and in regards to Psalm 83. Phase two is going to look at Daniel chapter 11 and Zechariah chapter 14, and then finally phase three, the battle culminating and consummating in what we call the Valley of of Jezreel, Armageddon. Let's get right in our study. Before we do, I need to clarify some issues because some have been commenting, and thanks for your comments. I read them, and I'm sorry I'm not able to reply to all of them due to the time constraint. However, we read them, and we pray for you. Now, 
Here is a example of in the days after the flood and particularly more specifically in the days of Ezekiel you need to know historically when Ezekiel is writing Ezekiel 38 39 we're talking about the battle of Gog and Magog uh, what was the geographical layout of the land you'll notice I ran across this chart this is after the flood remember Noah had his sons Shem Ham and Japheth and the sons of Japheth relocated north of the Black Sea that's why we locate this as Gog and Magog. Magog being Russia or Rosh and then Meshach, Tubal, Tagarma. This is the Black Sea right here. I thought I'd just bring this up to let you know. I know many are commenting and saying that they don't think this is the geographical location. But first we're setting the stage as the beginning of the tribulation. Remember the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation. That's Antichrist confirms this covenant. This global ruler, this one world government, one world currency, which we can see we're already moving toward that. Even in America, the feds have passed out information concerning a central bank digital currency trying to keep up with China and Russia. We've already implemented the one. That's another story for another time, but it all fits into God's overall plan of things. So you got Gog and Magog invasion. Let's go a little deeper into this in more detail. You can see these countries, Russia right up here. In fact, some identify in Ezekiel 38, Son of Man. 93 times Ezekiel is called the Son of Man. 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. Remember, Ezekiel saw the glory of the Lord. The first 32 chapters are dealing with God's judgment. The last uh, 33 through 48, jubilation. The Lord promises to restore Israel back to their homeland and what we call Aliyahs as they return and Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37 and then Ezekiel 38 39 describes these nations coalition of nations led by Magog Russia and interesting to note they're in uh, invading Ukraine right now some identify Ukraine as Magog at any rate you'll see Russia Turkey Iran which is Persia now right now we've got a nuclear deal on the table with Iran imagine Iran is listed in Ezekiel 38.5 as Persia, which before 1936 was inclusive of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. You know, Afghanistan, Taliban, God's end time plan. You can see our video on that, which just happened not long ago. And then you've got these other countries listed, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Notice this is the Armageddon coalition. Some identify Ezekiel 38 and 39 and call it Armageddon. Unfortunately, that's not Armageddon. It's the beginning of the tribulation that culminates and leads up to Armageddon. There's a series of battles in the tribulation time. And I put this at the beginning of the tribulation rather than at the end of the tribulation, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And again, please differentiate between Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 20. I preached a whole message on that. You can see that on our video because I think some uh, confuse the two. They're not the same battle, two different battles, Revelation 20, Gog and Magog, and Ezekiel 38, 39. But uh, Psalm 83 also can be coupled with Ezekiel 38, 39. These nations, uh, whether some put it at the same battle at the beginning of the tribulation or somewhere shortly thereafter, Psalm 83 lists the nations that will be included in the beginning of this battle of the tribulation. Other nations besides Russia and Turkey, which would be Meshach, Tubal, Tagarma, and Iran, and uh, Afghanistan, and uh, other nations uh, that are listed there, Ethiopia. And yet Psalm 83, phase one of the battle, we'll come to it in a minute, you can see the other nations that are listed in Psalm 83, for example, uh, this would be Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is also the Ishmaelites and Jabal and Tyre, which would be up here in the location of Lebanon. And Syria is listed as well. But this map is simply to point out Moab, Ammon, and Edom, which is also listed in the book of Psalm 83. These nations will also come against Israel. This is be in modern-day Jordan. And then again, you can see up in the corner of the EU, which would be at least the headquarters of the Antichrist. I believe that will, he will set up these ten kings who are listed as ten horns in the book of Daniel chapter 7. And also ten kings are defined in Revelation chapter 17 as the headquarters and even Mystery Babylon, 
will take a part in as a religious uh, ruler, this mystery Babylon, a apostate church, and partner with the beast who the harlot is riding, as in Revelation chapter 17. Political ruler, the beast, Mr. Babylon, the uh, prostitute, or the harlot as the religious ruler. All of this is the beginning of the tribulation. I'm just simply pointing that out to include what is going to take place as we think about this Gog and Magog leading to Armageddon. I want you to pay attention, please, for a moment to the book of Zechariah. Before I read this, I want to define four apocalyptic books. You may be aware, you may not. If you study Bible prophecy, it's important to compare Scripture with Scripture, all the Bible, but especially the book of Zechariah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation, the Apocalypses, the unveiling. Those four are the main apocalyptic books. However, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, and really throughout the New Testament. But in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 4 and 5, remember, Zechariah is both a prophet and a priest. And Zechariah is writing from a historical perspective as well as a prophetical perspective. What do I mean? First, historically, the Jews came and rebuilt the temple. Under Zechariah and Haggai, the prophet, preaching in Zerubbabel, because the temple had been destroyed in 586 B.C., the Jews had been taken in captivity for 70 years, as Jeremiah 25.10 declares would be the case and yet to the date God under Cyrus the king the book of Ezra chapter 1 allows 50,000 Jews to go back to their homeland why to rebuild the temple so Zechariah is writing from a historical perspective secondly he's writing from a prophetical perspective what do I mean he says in that day chapter 12 13 14 and uh, depicts and there's a lot of Bible prophecy that I'm skipping over in Zechariah simply to bring us to where we're at in chapter 14 Read this with me. His feet. Well, let me just back up to verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now we get the context of what Zechariah is talking about. The day of the Lord. That's a key phrase. When God intervenes in the human history, the affairs of humans on earth, there's a general definition, a specific definition of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, generally speaking, is 1,007 years. After the rapture of the church, Seven years of tribulation, 1,000 years, 1,007 years. So when you read the Bible, the day of the Lord, you need to ask which day of, the, day of the Lord is he talking about? Generally speaking or specifically? The specific definition of the day of the Lord is when Christ puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. When Jesus comes again, how do you know the difference in the two, the day of the Lord? By the context as which you're reading. And in this case, this is specifically when Christ comes in his second coming. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. The Lord will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. I'm quoting from chapter 14, verse 2. And the Lord shall go forth to fight against the nations as he did in the day of battle. Here's verse 4. And his feet, this is after the rapture of the church, the tribulation, seven years, and Jesus comes back in his second coming. He's describing it. He comes to the earth. In the rapture, he comes in the air. Second coming, his feet comes to the earth. His feet shall stand in that day key phrase in that day upon the Mount of Olives that's where he left remember in his ascension after he was crucified on the cross for my sins and your sins oh praise the Lord Jesus loves us he proved it he paid a price I couldn't pay a debt he didn't know he came to die he was born to die but he was born to rise again and when he rose again he conquered death hell sin and the grave that's why we have a promise of eternal life Jesus holds the keys and then he went to the Mount of Olives and held his hands up and ascended into heaven and said, He's coming again. In my Father's house and many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I'm there you may be also. He said, in that day on the Mount of Olives, which he left, he said, which is before Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, shall cleave in two from the midst thereof toward the east and the west, and there shall be a great valley. Things are going to change. I'm going to show you a map in a moment and show you the topographical and geographical transformation that's going to take place when Christ comes again in his second coming. He says, and half of the mountain shall be removed to the north and half into the south. Look at this verse 5, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. I used to think for a long time, ye, who's he talking about there? I believe he's talking about those 
armies that gather. Now, I know the Jews will be included as to be protected during the tribulation. One third, according to Zechariah 13, 8, will be spared and will turn to their Messiah, whom they've pierced. They look upon him and mourn whom they pierced. That's Zechariah 12, verse 10. And Paul said they'll be saved in a day. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. And Zechariah 3, 9 says all of Israel will be saved in a day. Those that trust him, he'll have a specific place for them to be preserved. I think some suggest that's 176 miles from the, what well, we're going to see, the Valley of Jezreel, where you saw me standing a minute ago. Battle of Armageddon, 176 miles exactly, will be the place where many point to the Red Rock City, one of the seven wonders of the world where we went, namely Petra. Well, we'll see. And notice, and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains. Some say this is, remember now, Jerusalem. Jerusalem right now is eight and a half miles wide. But in, after Christ comes and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, it's going to be absolutely changed to 2,500 Square miles, 50 miles on one side, 50 miles on the other. Now, Israel is only 70 miles wide right now. You get an idea, this is going into the millennial reign. We'll study more about that at a future time. But Israel and, and will be changed, needless to say, and Jerusalem more specifically. Now, I want you to get look at this map as we talk about Gog and Magog and Megiddo as to the valley of the a uh, war that's going to be taking place. First, the campaign, Gog and Magog. I believe at the beginning of the tribulation, seven years it'll take for the armies to be burned. Unwalled cities, a time of peace and safety, uh, a hook and a jaw, bringing down perhaps these Russians so forth for the, some say gold and silver, some say oil. I don't really know, but I know God's going to bring them down from the north and then absolutely devastate them. The Lord's going to intervene in the form of earthquakes and infighting and, and other pestilences are listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Psalm 83, the same thing. The Lord's going to intervene. And all of this is in the tribulation leading up to the valley of uh, Jezreel, namely Armageddon. But remember, at the end of the tribulation, Christ comes and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Do you know how far it is from Jerusalem to Megiddo? I looked it up today, 90 miles. And around 90 miles. Now, the battle starts here in Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley. you got the Temple Mount sloping down and sloping up to the Mount of Olives. Here's where it will begin. And Jesus Christ will change this topography. You'll flee to the mountains. Many believe that the armies of the Antichrist will be brought to Jerusalem. Remember, we read that in Zechariah 14 and verse 2. And he said, uh, God will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And that means America, if America's left. Right now, we're restraining the churches, America. And once the church is snatched away, the restrainer will be taken away. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5, 6, 7, 8. And yet, this is where the armies are going to end up, called the Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel. We got phase one, the battle. We've talked about phase two. Now we're talking about phase 3, Revelation chapter 16 and Revelation 19. Now here we find in Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 following, the sixth angel, remember now, seven seals, chapter 6 to chapter 8, seven trumpets, chapter 9 through uh, chapter uh, 16, and then 16 begins the seven vials. All these increasing rapidity and severity. God pouring out his wrath upon the earth. The church is raptured. 144,000 Jews will be supernaturally sealed. 144,000 because of the preaching of the two witnesses. In Revelation chapter 11, many Gentiles will be saved. Some debate as to whether they've ever heard the gospel. At any rate, here's where the great river, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water there was, was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east it might be prepared. I want to, you to pay attention to that. Revelation chapter 12. I meant to say Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. And the kings of the east might be prepared. Where's the Euphrates River? It's right about uh, in this neighborhood. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, you're talking about Persia. You're talking about Iraq, Euphrates River. 
separates the Far East from the Middle East. And listen to what the word of the Lord says. And it, I saw three unclean spirits, John said, inspired by the spirit like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that's the Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, there's the unholy trinity, Satan, the beast Antichrist, and, and the false prophet, the unholy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, being the co-equal in the Godhead. At any rate, we read verse 14 of chapter 16. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which shall go forth unto the kings of the earth, and the whole earth to gather them together to battle, pull them a campaign, that that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief, and blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garments. He says, and I gather them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Here is our setting. Here is our description. Here are the kings of the east. Who are these kings of the east? I personally believe China will be in this crowd. And those, not everybody in China. There's some Christians in China. There are Christians all over the world. So when I mention these nations, Christians in Russia, uh, I'm not talking about them, but I'm talking about the unbelievers. And these kings of the east, perhaps uh, North Korea is involved. I don't know. But anyway, they're going to come across the Euphrates. Demon spirits are going to deceive them. You know, Jesus said deception would be a common denominator in the end time. In the Olivet Discourse, for example, in the book of Matthew chapter 24, he said, verse 4, verse 5, verse 11, verse 24, deception, deception, deception. In fact, in the end time, the Lord said through Paul, for this cause shall God send them a strong delusion. They might believe a lie that they may all be damned because they received not the truth but had pleasure in it and righteousness. I talked with some young people the other night. You know what they told me? They said, you can't trust people. We can't trust people. Young people are getting all kind of information and disinformation. We've got to build relationships with them. We've got to share with them the love of God. We've got to pray the Holy Spirit opens their eyes. Many are deceived. Many are misled. I've been there. Thank God for His grace. Oh, yes. So you see how this is going to end up. The last days, the battle of Armageddon. We talked tonight about Gog and Magog and how this thing is going to unfold. The beginning of the tribulation, how these nations will come against Israel. We can see things lining up today. I'm not one to believe in sensationalism and say, oh, all of this is a fulfillment of the Bible. No, but I'm saying these are stage setters, what we're seeing today. I'm saying this will happen in the future, and perhaps it can happen sooner than we think. We're seeing certainly uh, precursors to the fulfillment of the Word of God. So all of this means Christ will come again in His second coming. Oh, on a great white horse with a crown on His head, a diadem, King of kings, Lord of lords. He's defeated the devil. And the Antichrist will be thrown in the lake of fire during the battle of Armageddon. And the beast and the false prophet and eventually after the millennial reign, Satan will be thrown in the lake of fire. I'm telling you, praise the Lord. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Have you made peace with God? Do you have a relationship with Him? Not religion, but a relationship. How about it today? Do you see things happening out of your control? Why not put your life under His control? Because He's in control. He sets up kings. He puts down kings. Things are going according to the plan of God. I want to pray for you now. The Lord will help us to stay focused, reaching people, sharing with our loved ones as we study the Bible together, not just for information, application. Go and tell, and let's do it together for the glory of our Lord as we prepare to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, or we'll see him as he escorts us into glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for your word, and I want to bless you, Jesus, for those listening now. I thank you for changing my heart and forgiving my sin, and I'm asking now for many, 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 Lord, that you've given us an open door in foreign countries and in America and all around. And we pray you'll get the glory, Jesus, because you deserve it. You are fulfilling your word. Help us to see. Help us to believe. Help us to trust. And we'll thank you and praise you, Jesus. And give great grace to those listening to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Soldiers of the cross, until one day we see you face to face. And we'll bless you for it. 
because we thank you, your word that it be praised in Jesus' name, Father. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. I really mean that. And God be with you till we meet again.